welcome to another edition of RCE. Again, this is Brock Palin. You can find us online in our entire back catalog at rce-cast.com. Uh, you can also find links to all the Twitters and the blogs and everything there where you can find other ways to get a hold of us. Also, please feel free to send in nominations for topics to have on the show. Also, uh, we have Jeff Squires here, as always, helping us out. Jeff, thanks again for your time. Hey, Brock. It's another lovely spring day and another cool topic to talk about today. What do we got? Um, Today, uh, this is actually something I ran into looking, uh, I think it was the NERSC website, and I was curious, okay, what the heck is this thing? And it is called SciDB, and so I will admit that um, the whole reason I dragged our guests on here today is because I want to figure out what it is. Uh, So our guest today is Paul Brown. Um, Paul, why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself? So hi, I'm, this is, uh, my name is Paul Brown. Um, I'm the uh, architect of SciDB. Uh, the firm I work for is the commercial wing, which is called uh, Paradigm 4. You can find uh, SciDB at www.scidb.org and Paradigm 4 at uh, www.paradigm4, that's Paradigm 1 word 4, one number, dot com. Um, Paradigm 4 is the sponsor for SciDB and uh, I work for them. Um, my background, I've, I've, uh, I've worked for a heap of database companies that started with the letter I. So I worked for Illustra, I worked for Ingress, I worked for Informix and uh, I spent 10 years at IBM. Uh, and then uh, when SciDB started up, uh, I joined SciDB as the, uh, the architect and uh, general dog's body. So what is SciDB? That's a it's a good place to start. Um, so SciDB, it stands for Science Database. And you remember the name Paradigm 4 for the company. So the point of or the, the, the motivation for SciDB was the work of the late Jim Gray, uh, improving data management uh, tools and technologies and platforms uh, for scientists. So Jim spent a lot of time at Johns Hopkins working on Sloan. And uh, SciDB was kicked off out of an XLDB, uh, Extra Large Databases, research group. And uh, my boss, well, my boss's boss, Mike Stonebreaker, and uh, his colleague, uh, DeWitt, Dave DeWitt, uh, spent a lot of time walking around and uh, asking scientists what they wanted in a database platform. And it sort of broadened out a little bit from just databases. And uh, we built SciDB uh, to meet those requirements. Now, when you hear the term database, we've all kind of been conditioned, conditioned to think, you know, relational database, SQL, and now there's these young upstarts, the no SQL crowds and things like that. Is, is SciDB fit in one of these two categories? So the, the, the other thing about that word database is it's a uh, database management system is it's, it's much older than relational, and I suspect it'll be much newer than, uh, than the, the NoSQL guys. It'll, it'll keep on going. So if you look back, we had hierarchical and network databases. We had relational databases. We had object-oriented databases. We had uh, uh, XML databases. And now we've got NoSQL databases. So SciDB, is, it's, it sort of continues that grand tradition of coming up with a new name. But the signature difference between SciDB and what's gone before is that uh, we've, we've chosen uh, arrays and matrices as our our building block for our storage manager and as the uh, internal uh, unit of uh, data processing in our query engine. So think about SciDB. It's if you pick up a SQL database engine and you think relations, uh, don't think relations with SciDB. Think arrays and matrices. So... Is there how, how, internally? How do you guys do stuff though? Like, uh, is it closer related to? A, would you say it's more closely related to a traditional SQL database, a columnar database, or like a Vertica or something like that, or a NoSQL object store? So think think about almost all of the above. So the data model, and, and at the at the risk of doing a bit of a, a bit of. A, a bit of a lecture here. So it's uh, multidimensional arrays is the organizational principle. So every time you organize data, you store it in an array. And uh, the array, each cell in the array, each logical position can have multiple attributes. So the first thing we do is like a column store, we just divide the database up into, you can think about it as, as one array per attribute. So it's a horizontal, it's a vertically partitioned data store. But the second thing we do is that we, we basically asked the, the boys and girls who've been doing array processing for 20-odd years, we said, well, what do you do with arrays? And they said, well, uh, we chop them up into rectilinear uh, partitions, 
uh, we store the partitions uh, separately. We might spread them out over a file system or uh, divide them up into a collection of um, uh, HDF5 files. Uh, and then we do parallel processing um, by organizing our algorithms to deal with uh, you know, the, the access to each of these subarrays, each of these um, rectilinear chunks, we call them, and then the, ro- the sort of uh, rotation or mutation of data around the nodes that make up your massively parallel system. So I guess the Tensor Tour is that, yeah, we're a column store insofar as we divide stuff up into one column per attribute of the array's cells, but then internally we organize ourselves in the same way that uh, that uh, people have done um, big square uh, databases before. Just we do transactions as well, so there's a database piece in there when you update uh, the array. Uh, it's a t- it's a, uh, we make acidic guarantees. And we have a query language. It looks a bit like, if you remember, there was an old language from the late 60s, early 70s called APL. So when you manipulate the objects, you do things like array multiplies or filters or uh, you know, array vector products, that kind of thing. So uh, <laughs> what you just said there gave me a lot of questions. So the first question, though, is you mentioned HDF5 and the fact that you're trying to store data a lot of the same ways that scientists may store um, you know, data partitioned across a big, uh, you know, parallel job or some sort of data parallel job. Can you actually compute directly against data in PsyDB using like the MPIO functions or something like that? It's sort of the other way around. Uh, we pulled the MPI framework inside PsyDB. So what you do is, you know, supposing you want to do something like a, a big truncated SVD is a good example because we, we, did, we did that. So one of the things that we did in our design and implementation process is we wandered down to, to the North Carolina and we, we talked to Jack Dunger and we sort of said, okay, how do, we, how do, you, how do, the, how do the boys with um, belts and suspenders do this for a living? And uh, we learned from him how you do block cyclic uh, or block partitioned algorithms for uh, linear algebra. We learned how you do, uh, you know, block cyclic uh, rotation of data through the nodes. Uh, we looked at his uh, scalar pack implementation, the way it uses MPI, uh, and we grabbed as much of that technology as we could, and uh, we've reused it inside PsyDB. So if you've got, you know, a, a, um, a very large matrix that so we do sort of 60,000 by 50,000 is the size that we sort of run into on a regular basis, and you want to compute the top two coefficients of a truncated SVD, that's the sort of operation you just directly ask. You say literally GESVD of array A, and we return your three arrays, your TVU, and uh, you can figure out data from there. And we make it scale as best you can. Those they're, it's, they're, they're all cubic algorithms in this space, but we make it scale by using as much of the hardware uh, as it at run on as we can. Um, and I guess that the, the thing to sort of step back a bit is that isn't just that TE, that GESVD operation, uh, general purpose uh, single value composition. It sits alongside a very large list of other, you might think of them as sort of more orthodox data operations. So, you know, filters and slices and betweens and shape changes and uh, dimension reduction algorithms and things like that. So the idea is to have this composable language, a functional language that combines um, high-level linear algebra operations with lots and lots of kind of low-level useful things, you know, filters and aggregations and group buys and regrids, windows, that sort of stuff. So this is interesting. So did I hear you correctly say that you actually use MPI inside the database? And so therefore, your database infrastructure could actually span tens, hundreds, or even thousands of nodes, depending on how many clients or, or types of jobs you're serving simultaneously. Yep. Is that is that a goal of what you're going for? Yep, exactly. Um, so at the moment, our, our biggest sites have sort of 200 to 400 physical nodes. Uh, you can do an awful lot of damage with 400, you know, modern uh, Intel 16 core boxes with, you know, 60, 32 gig of memory on each of them. There's a, that's an awful lot of compute power. And we really just, purely because we just haven't had the capital, we haven't been able to push much beyond that. But there's no particular reason in principle, um, given the architectural design, uh, that, that we couldn't. So again, uh, sort of our background is I, I worked on, on you know, high-end DB2 and I've worked on uh, massively parallel informics engines in the past. And it wasn't uncommon. It was a bit rare. We only had sort of a handful of them. But, you know, we can run a, a big relational database engine, a big SQL engine on 
on a thousand nodes. You know, it's not ideal. And the, the really the principal difficulty you have is that for any sufficiently long running job on a thousand nodes, you're, you're going to have node failure and your relational engines didn't deal or don't deal with single instance or single physical node value very well in that kind of configuration. So we borrowed a bunch of ideas from people like Hadoop and um, uh, to sort of to harden the system. So if a single instance goes down, um, we have to halt the running processes, but we don't we don't cease access. You can continue to ask queries of the system. We we pick up data and we partition it and we replicate it on multiple physical nodes. So the loss of any one physical node doesn't mean a loss of service. You can continue to ask queries. But yeah, the, the goal was to sort of pick a bunch of technology that we knew worked from these massively parallel relational engines that scale quite well uh, to figure and then to sort of uh, to integrate that with, um, with the, the linear algebra and the array algebra that we knew we could get from Scalapack. This is, uh, this is interesting because MPI is actually traditionally, or at least MPI implementations, are, are pretty terrible at default tolerance. And you're saying you've kind of worked around that. I'm, I'm kind of, you have to forgive me. I'm an MPI implementer, so these things kind of perk up my ears here. Uh, I'm assuming you've kind of worked around that by doing smaller individual jobs rather than one monolithic system that is all MPI all the time. Is that somewhere close to reality? Yeah, that's exactly right. The um, We only dip our toe in the MPI world when we know we have to. So, you know, for the very, very big SVD operations and matrix multipliers, dense matrix multipliers, um, MPI is the, it's the only game in town. It's the way to make that work. We're, we are vulnerable if uh, if the MPI system that we call out to, if it has an issue or a failure, it just reports back to us, yes, I failed. And we sort of have no choice but to kind of reinitialize the whole job again. Uh, from the point of view of the person writing the queries, though, that's sort of a, a hidden from them a bit. So they put the query in, the query, you know, it, it chugs along, and it might take twice as long to complete as it would do ideally. Um, but the other thing is that in the SciDB core, the piece that we do the, the work with, so there's a sort of an important point that doesn't, I think, come across as well in some of the science literature. Um, we found when we began using SciDB in anger that in addition to those big dense operations that MPI and Scalar Pack are really tuned for, an awful lot of science data falls into the category of being sort of very, very sparse. And the nature of the algorithms that you want to run in a very sparse matrix multiply or a very sparse SVD they're, they're quite different. So we've managed to get away with implementing uh, sparse algorithms in the same framework. So we still use the MPP framework, but the sparse algorithms themselves, we, we don't use MPI for those. We use our own internal uh, secret source. And because the bottleneck in those algorithms, it doesn't tend to be the, um, the, the rotation. It tends to be just sort of the local block-to-block -block operations given the way that sparsity can be factored out you can sort of you can you can you can condense uh the sparse chunks to a small number um of of larger units and you can operate on them locally so we've been able to get a lot of the sparse algorithms working inside SciDB without the need for recourse to MPI when we throw the 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 computation over the wall to MPI if MPI fails on us we report a happy error message and just sort of try to repeat the job um, that's the best that we can do. The medium to long term goal, though, here, here is just just to sort of, you know, we we don't have the same kind of of um, momentum in the MPI community uh, as a lot of other players do. So we have sort of we, we have basic ideas for, and again, this is back to good old fashioned database land. Um, of we we sort of we know how to keep multiple uh, nodes up and operating and, and computationally um, uh, integrated. And again, this is this is stuff that that we learned with uh, using elaborate use of lamp clocks and, and heartbeat mechanisms with periodic um, uh, serialization to disk and checkpointing. We know how to do this stuff from SQL engines, and so our thought was that once we get enough momentum, you know, maybe we can help out the MPI community a bit by bringing some ideas from from that world, from that highly reliable relational world. Uh, to sort of um, uh, to harden up the MPI infrastructure in the way that we use it, and then you know maybe help by putting some of that stuff back with uh, back with the community. It depends. I, I don't know how um, uh, how 
given the other things that we do. So, you know, SQL, SciDB is a, we're, we're a, we're a transactional engine. Uh, you know, we, we succeed or fail. We have isolated, um, uh, access levels. So, you know, two users have two independent perspectives of what's going on. We support concurrent readers and writers. So you can be reading a data set at the same time. Somebody else is writing to it. Uh, we have a lot of these, that level of support. So it's not quite clear whether MPI, in the general sense, really needs what we're trying to do with it. But from our point of view, being able to put you know, lamp clocks and keep alive heartbeats on the MPI nodes uh, in a way that would allow us to sort of reroute or restart queries from checkpoints, that would be a very useful thing for us to be able to do. So you said a lot of things there, and you know I'm a cluster admin, and I'm used to having jobs that run for you know up to hundreds of hours at a time. And it sounds like you want people to do everything inside of it, but at the same time, it sounds like you're still kind of keeping a little bit of an interactive system. How do you really see SciDB mixing in with the regular, you could say, research research resource portfolio? How do you think it should be used? When should we use traditional large-scale batch systems with scratch file systems and import data in? Or when should we run directly on SciDB? <laughs> we've, we've got a crack team of sales and marketing people trying to answer that question right now. Um, we, we really don't know. Um, it's very early days. We've only been uh, in the market aggressively for, and I say aggressively, we you know, we, we don't do a lot of this kind of marketing. Our emphasis tends to be on, um, and this is a bit of marketing speak now, but we tend to be very lead generation focused. So uh, we'll attend user groups that, that have uh, an interest in, for example, a tool like R, right, the, the open source R product. And you mentioned about the difference between interactivity and batch processing. Most of the users that we have tend to be sort of taking a tool uh, like R or a tool like MATLAB, which at some level are fundamentally interactive, right? They're not you, – you don't run a, a – you know, you don't run a weak job I- inside uh, R unless you're doing something um, unnatural. Um, and so our focus historically has been on these folk who are doing um, – you know, I've got – they've got, um, um, you know, a, a 15, 15 to 25 terabyte data set that's coming in. Um, while it's possible that we might want to do an all-pairs covariance calculation on that kind of data set, that would take an awful long time to do. But typically what they want to end up doing is they want to be able to interactively uh, look at the data, examine it. Uh, and do sort of localized experiments. It's still big. There's still hundreds of gigabytes in size, but this stuff doesn't tend to to run for the full, you know, a full week, 10 days duration. It tends to be the sort of thing where you can get some sort of bootstrap, you can get some sort of sampling. You do something quite sophisticated with it. You're not, you're not, we're not just doing SQL group, you know, rolls up, roll ups and, uh, and group buys, but you're doing something sophisticated enough that you need a tool with the linear algebra built in or with the linear algebra framework. And then perhaps you want to run a big job, but for the most part, our batch stuff, it, it doesn't tend to be the multi day run times. They tend to be, you know, overnight weekend jobs. The kind of workload which, if you come from a world of doing um, the business data analytics, you know, folk who do, you know, friends and family for Sprint or, um, you know, some of those, you know, uh, load calculations and yield calculations on airline reservation systems, those jobs are big. They run, you know, 20, 12 to 24 hours to 48 hours. But typically the actionable information has to be returned every couple of days. So at the moment, I guess on that spectrum, Think about the CIDB framework as being you know, a tool that users of R who are familiar with R or MATLAB or running little Python scripts, um, that they sort of run into scalability limitations quite quickly, right? You can't do that much with R, but suddenly they sort of say, look, I'm suddenly getting an order of magnitude more data. I need to go big. Well, we, slit, we sit in as a platform that can run behind those interactive tools and happily do you know forty eight hour jobs for them, as well as supporting the multi user and very interactive query workload as well. Does that answer the question? Because I'm not quite sure if, if that touched on your point. No, I think that did because you know I, I was worried about like kind of concurrency 
it's I don't know. I mean, the more you talk about this stuff, the more I actually think about the different ways people are using Hadoop, using certain add-ons like Hive, Pig, um, which you know have longer startup times, but then they use something like Impala or HBase for quick turnaround time, um, for more interactive type use. And it sounds like you're trying to almost solve everything, um, but it really sounds like it could be a useful thing for heavier need post data analytics like post processing i mean maybe analytics is a bad word to use but it's just that's the first thing that kind of comes to mind i have a bunch of data produced maybe someplace else and now i kind of want to slice and dice it but it's bigger than the usual drag to my desktop post processing job yeah that's that's pretty much right and and just to sort of you know it's actually amusing to us so we've we've watched the evolution of hadoop over the the last little while and um, you know, from starting out with a very heavy emphasis on MapReduce, it's been amusing over the last little while. To, you know, we we went out and we sort of said, uh, query languages are very useful. You know, they're massively productive and they're useful. And and MapReduce, you know, it's sort of because it doesn't do peer to peer very well, and and because it doesn't stream things particularly well, you have to use the file system. It, it's not going to really work in this interactive mode, right? You, as you mentioned, you, you, you're starting up a job is expensive. And now, having you know, having sort of mentioned that or having mumbled about that obliquely for the last few years, we suddenly noticed that all of the the Hadoop vendors, your Clouderas and your Cloudens and your MapRs of the world, uh, they're all out there building what look like uh, massively parallel SQL frameworks. This is the Impala. You know, it doesn't use MapReduce. It uses HDFS, but essentially, it sits atop HDFS and implements. You know, what if you sort of look at it long enough and sort of stare at it hard enough, it looks like a pretty classic SQL top end MPP SQL framework. And that that brings me, I think, to the to the key distinction. We're not really we're gonna be kind of okay at that stuff, yeah. We're we're not going to do any of the um the stuff that MapReduce was traditionally uh excelled at. So if what you're doing is taking um you know web log information or uh, you know, some sort of streaming information from a lot of sensors, and you've got to do some kind of uh, on-the-fly conversion for that. It's heavily, it's unstructured. Perhaps it's it uses a JSON file, a JSON model, or an XML model, or something like that, and it's heavily string manipulation focused. You know, that's not really. We're not going to be very especially good at that. And then if you look at the way that the SQL guys are working, you know, they're going to try to implement something pretty close to full SQL 92. They're going to sort of, they're going to add joins and subqueries and unions and intersections and divisions and all that good SQL framework. Um, we're not really that focused on that either. We're not going to be a general purpose query tool. It's really once you start hitting um, anything that involves a, a ma- anything where expressing the problem in a matrix algebra is the way to go. That's where we really, that's, that's our goal. That's our target. So again, big multiplies, all pairs, correlation calculations, um, uh, SVDs, K-means clustering, anything that involves an underlying algorithm, which is just fundamentally not embarrassingly parallelizable. So a good example is GLM. Um, basically, everybody can do a pretty good job at GLM because GLM is is embarrassingly parallelizable, but all pairs Pearson is not. That's a cubic problem that you've really got to use scalar pack to do anything to get Teddy's scale on. Um, so we're much more focused on the uh, the linear algebra piece than we are on the straightforward SQL piece. That said, we'll be okay at SQL, but I, I wouldn't try to use us for doing uh, weblog analytics or, um, you know, something that's heavily textual. All right. So you covered a, a tremendous amount of ground in there. It, it sounds like you are really differentiating what CIDB is for uh, compared to a lot of the usual paradigms that, that come to mind when people think about databases and big data and things like that. So if I could read between the lines here and having read from your website and various other sources, it sounds like you really are targeting the science market and you are optimizing for that case. And and therefore, it's kind of a new niche. It's database as applied to scientific computing and things like that. And that allows you to get all kinds of speed ups and optimizations. Is that a, a, an accurate characterization? Yeah, the way our crack marketing department describe it now, they, they refer to us as a computational database. 
with exactly that idea that it's it's all about science. And the curious thing is, I, I know you chaps are from you know supercomputing um, background, but there's an awful lot of um, uh, science is now bleeding over into industry. Okay, so how do users actually interact with this? Uh, what is it traditional SQL or do you have you like expanded it to kind of work with like a data parallel type system? Um, or can you basically write your own user defined functions? Like how, what languages and ways can you interact with CIDB? I, I know you chaps want short answers, so I'll try to keep it short. Um, the first thing is that uh, CIDB itself is extensible. It's it's a microkernel architecture. So if you know how to program in C, C++, you can, much like you can with Postgres, for example, add user-defined types and functions and aggregates, and even uh, linear algebra operators. So an operator like multiply, you can add that. Um, at the second level up, we have this very definite perspective, which is that declarative query languages or query languages in general, not so much for the science community, I think, because there's a, you know, a higher higher IQ crowd there. Um, but often what you end up with, with uh, folks in industry is they prefer the high-level query languages uh, largely because they, 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 they need more productivity. They need return on their investment. And their investment is not just the hardware. It's chiefly it's the time of the people writing programs. So we've provided two, uh, call, them, call them query languages. Uh, one's a functional language we call AFL. It's heavily influenced by uh, APL, the original array processing language, or A programming language as it was the acronym. And we have a language called AQL, uh, which is an array query language, which looks, it looks, or I shouldn't say it looks, it smells like SQL, but as a point of technical divergence, the underlying algebra is different. Set theoretic versus matrix algebras look very different. At the top end, um, you know, if you want to program in R, we have two packages. Uh, CIDB R and CIDB Python, uh, where you can basically run your R package on the client side and talk to CIDB over port 80. Um, the same thing works with Python. And we also have a, a JDBC uh, driver on the client side, so you can program in Java if, um, you, know, if, if you were born in a different millennium. Uh, real quick, I kind of mentioned it earlier. Have you thought about making it possible to talk directly to CIDB from an MPI cluster? Yeah, so we the codes there, we just don't like to talk about it very much. Um, and look, the reason is that that the from a marketing point of view, um, we're trying to kind of hide a lot of those details. If, if you work for for Caterpillar, for example, and what you've got is you've got you know ten thousand um, uh, big uh, pieces of industrial equipment, each of which has ten thousand sensors, each of which is generating you know a couple of um, you know sixteen thirty two bytes per second from each of those sensors. You run that for a year, you've got a huge amount of data, and making sense out of that is a classic application of of uh, signal processing at the very high end. The executives who run those companies they don't really care much about MPI. They just want their all pairs correlations to work. They want to be able to try to use uh, principal components analysis to cluster their machinery to different kinds of classes. So we don't talk about it much because it, it doesn't enter into the conversation at the level of the folk that we talk to. And so we haven't documented it. But the entire product's open source. And um, if you wanted to grab it and download it, you know, we do have this back end that will enable you to reach out to somebody else's MPI framework uh, and surface a fairly thin uh, operator inside the query language to drive the whole thing. Now, changing direction a little bit here, we've talked a lot about uh, these large queries and clusters and things like that. What kind of hardware do you typically run on? What, what servers, what networks, things like that? So this can be a quick answer. Um, we start out, we, we're currently available on the Ubuntu and CentOS slash Red Hat. So, uh, you know, any of the LTS releases of those platforms, our next release is going out on the new Ubuntu 14.4. Uh, um, so that's the, the basic configuration. We don't run on Windows yet. We don't run on Mac, um, Mumble. Uh, the rest of the hardware configuration runs the gamut. Um, we test routinely on Amazon AWS clusters. So we'll fire up a cluster of, you know, four of their middle-sized engines. We'll run 
64 side B instances on that, and off we go. But there's an important factor we've noticed with our customer base. So they run the gamut all the way from people like uh, NIH, for example, uh, who have an awful lot of data in their repository, but at any one point in time, only a relatively small set of it is active in the query base. So their users are focused on a particular area, or they're doing lots of sampling and so forth, and they're not really emphasizing the sophisticated math yet. So in that kind of configuration, it tends to be big disks, small CPU, small memory. On the other hand, some of the NERSC clusters that you guys bumped into, there's not a lot of data there. It's, you know, it's a, maybe 10 terabytes, but they're doing awfully big things with it. So that tends to be very CPU and very memory intensive. So I just, it's, it's a, uh, and unfortunately, it's a how long is a piece of string question. It really depends on the workload. Um, but we run the gamut from clouds to, you know, a small number of nodes with lots of memory and infrastructure to a large number of nodes with lots of local disk. Uh, we're really quite flexible in that way. We, we designed it that way. So uh, a, a, t a technical thing, you mentioned that you replicate data. Does that mean we don't have to worry about the underlying disk being reliable, kind of like Hadoop, like you just... You throw raw disks at it, and SciDB figures it out. Um, that's the that's the design goal. That's where we are now. We're not quite there yet. Um, we need to be able to figure out how to do uh, what's called replacement and provisioning elasticity. So currently, if a node goes down and dies completely, yeah, the you know I, I believe the admin line is the magic smoke got out of the box. Uh, if the magic smoke gets out of one of the boxes and you've got to put a new box in, the process for reinstalling and putting data back on that box is that it's very handy at the moment. It's very manual. Uh, you can continue to do to use the, the cluster for read queries, but we at the moment stop writes. We say, look, we can't guarantee this thing, so we're just going to stop you doing writes until the node is back. The other longer-term goal is to be able to do provisioning elasticity, which is – you know, I've, I'm, about to, I'm about to do a job which is, uh, I know it's a cubic problem, and I know it's going to be 10 terabytes of data. I want to spin up, you know, 100 nodes, which are just compute-only nodes, uh, and I want to run the job on the compute-only nodes, and then when that's done, I want to shut them down and put them to bed. We're not there yet. Um, everything is in place to do that. We've just got other priorities to do with um, uh, with quality and with uh, with simple things like load performance. But yeah, you're you're right. We, in a nutshell, we borrowed a bunch of ideas from the way that the HDF file, HDFS file system works to do the replication, um, and even older ideas. So if you go back to the Andrew file system and some of the uh, the block redundant file systems that were built in the 80s, uh, 80s through the mid 90s, we borrowed a bunch of ideas from there as well. So I'm looking on your website, and it looks like version uh, 13.x is uh, available these days. What uh, what kind of functionality avail is is in that? And actually, what does version 13.x mean? That that implies a very old product. So um, it's actually the latest version is 14.3 is the one we just put out. Um, we we coupled onto the way Ubuntu does its naming, so it's it's basically year dot month is the release uh, identification. Um, and we did that because if you look around the world, everybody sort of is, is it sort of 0 0.9, 0 0.99, 0 0.999. And we just felt that's, it's, you know, it's a bit, I wouldn't say dishonest, but it, it doesn't really reflect um, uh, when a thing came out. You know, you sort of, we want to be able, is, is 0 0.999 the latest is a difficult question to answer. Uh, uh, whereas if you look at it, having the, uh, the year and the the, the month number uh, gives you at least an idea of how old a particular platform or a particular product is. So, yeah, so 14.3, so the, the way it works out is that we started, the first real release was back in at the end of 2012. So I'd say 12.10 was our, was our first, uh, the, release, the, the release heard around the world. Um, the process since then has been an incremental addition of functionality as users have requested it. Um, we're very responsive to um, our, you know, our modestly sized user base at this stage. The latest 14.3 release, we actually have added uh, query language macros. So you're able to use let bindings uh, in the AFL expressions. And that's an example of a thing which uh, superficially, it, it looks easy, but when you've got a terabyte of data under management, 
the getting that right ends up being very hard from a um, from a performance point of view. So that's an example of a piece of functionality we added to help users write queries, the macros. Um, that it just takes a bit of time to get it in. And I guess the final thing is that you know we're we're very very conscious being you know we're database people a lot of us so we're back from the belt and suspenders community. Uh, we test the heck out of everything. Um, and, and that's it, that's a very important value. We, we, there's a lot of stuff in the product that we don't talk about very much because although the code's checked in, we're just not happy with quality quite yet. So you, you'll begin to see a few of these things over the next few releases. So uh, let's talk about um, kind of like the way the community is set up. So what's notice there's a community edition. You mentioned the product's open source, and then there's an enterprise edition. Uh, what's the difference between those? So... We've, um, we're following – there's actually a funny story about CIDB in the background. Um, I joined CIDB back in about 2011, 2010, um, and our original goal was to make this thing you know, a legitimate science platform uh, to get the whole thing spun up with NSF funding and to try to um, you know, follow the, 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 the orthodox route to making this work. The trouble is that Mike Stonebreaker was involved. And if you know anything about Mike Stonebreaker, you're aware that, that he has a reputation, a justified reputation of being a very good database entrepreneur. That's to say, he, he sort of, uh, he starts companies that attempt to sort of take ideas from the lab and put them out of the marketplace. So we found that, that um, you know, because I think in part because of Mike Stonebreaker's involvement, um, the funding agencies looked a bit askew us and sort of said, you know, you, you need to try this with the venture capital community. So we we sort of we took the we took the blue pill and uh, we talked to the venture capital crowd, and the venture capital crowd are very keen to get return on their investment. So the result is that we've got this kind of we follow the same model as Sleepy Cat, um, uh, the Red Hat community, and so forth with this dual license model. There's a an open source, uh, freely available and free to use uh, platform with no restrictions on it at all. Uh, you can grab it, you can use it, scales forever, all the queries work, and so forth. Uh, and that's the CIDB, the CIDB platform that you can get from the from the CIDB.org website. Then, of course, we're building the tools that make up the enterprise edition. So it's not so much an issue with science data processing, but if what you're doing is one of those systems I mentioned that's you know that's taking input from a very large number of sensors and is trying to figure out relationships or trying to detect errors in the sensor network, uh, you know that a machine's about to break down. You know that becomes a fairly critical piece of infrastructure. So having uh, software that keeps it up and running and lets users and administrators know when there are problems that comes at a premium. All that stuff is in the enterprise edition. Now you mentioned open source multiple times in there. What uh, specific license are you under? Very good. So the uh, the CIDB open source uh, is available under the uh, the Afero. GPL, uh, a GPL library. Uh, we had it in a GPL three for a while, but we found that there are some folk who got a bit nervous about that. So it's under the the um, Afero GPL license. Um, the closed source or the enterprise stuff. Um, I'm fairly adamant about even if I'm not, you know, our licensing on the enterprise side is the usual thing, but I am, it's the usual conflict with lawyers and venture capital folk. Um, but I'm rather keen. There are pieces of the enterprise um, uh, platform that we've licensed from people like Intel. And Intel won't let us put the source code for that out, which is another reason that we don't, we don't release under. Um, under GPL licenses or under any open source licenses on that side. But as much as possible, we put all of our source code in the, uh, you know, users who buy the enterprise license get as much source code as we can, as we can legally give them. Um, I just think that's a, that's a central value to how software should be developed. I'm, I'm a little disappointed that we have to include the Intel libraries. Now, this is the, the Intel MKL libraries, the linear algebra libraries that they ship on their own hardware. And you know that's their prerogative, and we wanted to bring that stuff to our customers. So we we sort of uh, we did that deal with the devil. Okay, so uh, a little curious. What you know, you talked about different ways of scaling a CIDB cluster, but in your mind, what is the largest CIDB cluster? The largest at the moment, um, I, I shouldn't, yeah, the largest at the moment is the, um, the one at NERSC, which last time I recall, 
uh, talking to Yushu was a um, was a 400 node instance they'd spun up there for uh, some of the data sets that they have. There's a larger one under construction at the NIH, um, and that the trouble with that number is it keeps changing a bit. They sort of say they're going to go to 500, and then they cut back, and then they get bigger again. Uh, but that's going to be a 400 terabyte data set um, of uh, biomedical information. So. It's it's changing every day. At the moment, the biggest one we have that's in what you'd call production condition is the NERSC platform. Um, but there's a bigger one coming online sometime in the next two or three months. Here's a random question uh, because I'm a developer, and whenever we talk to other developers, I just love to ask this question to hear the variety of answers. What uh, version control system do you use and why? So we use uh, we use Subversion, um, and we use Subversion purely for inertia reasons. Uh, we started out the the, the development there, um, and it, it's adequate to what we need it for. I think that the thing about any version control system. So I've used um, uh, inside IBM. I've used a, a variety of the IBM proprietary ones that they bought from uh, Clearcase. Um, I've used uh, ones like Piccolo, which became the p- uh, Perforce. I've used SVN Subversion. I've used uh, GitHub. Uh, th- there is th- this is there is no perfect system. They all have their advantages and disadvantages, and their, their drawbacks and their you know their their disastrous uh, corner cases. Um, and really, it, it's a case of uh, how far can you push the platform you have with the team you're working with. We're only five or six people at this stage. We're okay with subversion. As soon as that changes, we'll pick something else. But the next thing we pick will be to meet the specific problems that we're encountering. There's a terrible tendency in software development to behave like a bunch of seven-year-olds playing soccer. You know, oh, look, there's a shiny, shiny over there. Let's all go over there. Um, the plan is, um, I've, this is not my first rodeo, and I, I'm just planning to be a bit more uh, conservative. Now, let's just see which ones wash out, what the various pros and cons are, and then pick our way ahead uh, on our tool chain choices um, only as far as our headlights can see. Let's not, you know, just sort of chase the latest thing because it's the latest thing. All right, and then uh, I wonder if you could give us a, a little uh, a preview of what what are some of the things you guys are working on now, what's coming in uh, future 14.x and 15.x versions. Very good. So the this is actually sort of very, very exciting. Um, we've got we, – we, we have very ambitious plans. Um, the most immediate things that we're working on in the short run, uh, on the language side, we've got some very uh, aggressive uh, ideas about uh, pushing the boundaries of what you can do uh, with, uh, with a functional language as a data language, uh, both from the point of view of what the language's power is uh, and also from the point of view of the implementation. So there are a number of things because, you know, the idea of a no side affecting operator language is that you can uh, concurrently and in parallel compute uh, subcomponents of the plan. I, I could, you know, give you a 20-minute a, a conversation about this versus SQL processing where, you know, SQL processing tends to be dominated uh, by pipeline operators. You're sort of pumping data through a plan with relatively few things that block. Linear algebra operations often tend to block. There's a lot more uh, operators in the plan tree where before you can emit the first byte out, you have to take the last byte in. So this is a, both an opportunity and it's it's also a, um, a problem for query planning in general. So the language work we're doing is both to extend the power of the language to do to do things more uh, more elegantly uh, and you know, with just more uh, more power in the language, but also to figure out how we can build. Uh, a runtime engine underneath this thing that takes advantage of all the nice things you get out of a functional language in the context of a database engine, which is, uh, that's quite novel. No one's ever done that before. Uh, the second thing is that, um, you know, we're constantly working on uh, the the guts of the executing framework. So when what you're doing is, you know, is, is an awful lot of double precision multiple operations, vectorizing your engine, uh, organizing it so that you're using, taking advantage of modern chip technologies, modern chip ideas like the single instruction, multiple dispatch instructions inside the, the cores of these things. That ends up being an interesting engineering challenge from the point of view of a data management platform uh, because you've got to figure out how to 
uh, bundle up uh, blocks of data and how to minimize movement between your L1, L2 caches and your RAM. That's an interesting challenge, and we're just sort of trying to make the the, the guts of the thing go like a bat out of hell. Uh, the third thing is that this I've mentioned a couple of times the elasticity model. Um, we're very excited about the plans on that front. We want to be able to provide uh, not simply uh, the ability to sort of stop the system, add nodes, bring the system back up again, but this very dynamic provisioning model, this uh, elastic provisioning model, where you can say. I'm about to run a big job. It's going to take those 100 machines, spin up 100 machines and run the job on the 100 machines. That's not going to be here quite yet. That's a little way out. But we're laying the, the groundwork even now in the engine to get to that point. So users and administrators will be able to sort of say, there's a pool of 100 machines over there. Uh, I want to run this particular operation on that pool of 100 machines and then quest them once we're done. So that's that's the sort of stuff that you can see looking ahead. Query language improvements, performance improvements to make the thing go faster from the guts out, and this very ambitious goal we have of um, provisioning systems uh, in a way that can uh, sort of ease the burden on administrators and, uh, and end users to figure out physically where computation is happening. Okay, Paul, thank you very much for your time. Uh, where can people find information about uh, both the uh community version and the enterprise version of SciDB? So your best bet is the, the website and the forum we maintain. So for SciDB information, www.scidb.org slash forum, F-O-I-U-M. Uh, that's where our community kind of hang out and argue among themselves about the wisdom of our decisions. Um, www.paradigm4, that's P-A-R-A-D-I-G-M 4.com. That's the commercial side. Uh, and we've got websites, you know, we've got uh, email lists set up, so sort of support at paradigm4.com, info at paradigm4.com. Uh, you know, those are the, the email lists that I pay the most attention to. Okay, Paul, thank you very much for your time. No worries. Thanks, Thanks Paul. You guys. Really good conversation.